Welcome back from lunch. Uh, first, while I remember, I want to present to you Brian Jones in the back, filming all the videos, putting them online. Give him a big... <laughs> so tell your f friends and uh, colleagues who are not here that uh, videos will be posted online running. I'm also being informed by the volunteers and the leader of the volunteer pack to clean up after yourselves. There's bottles and glasses and cups standing around. Please bring them out there uh, when we're done, or when you're done with them. Um, next up, next part of our direct trade day is uh, Graziano. Thank you. He's born and raised in Boquete, Panama, has two uh, organic farms. He has an agronomic trait from the Samarana School in Honduras. He's a certified Q grader. His day-to-day -day work is uh, working with uh, HIU coffees, Microlot uh, coffee farm projects. He will tell you more about that uh, himself. Okay. There will be two sessions. First one session about different varietals and how he works with them. And after that, it will be processing. Please give him a big hand. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Okay, good afternoon. Thanks a lot. It's a really honor to be with you guys here. I think it is one of the most interesting coffee markets in the world, Scandinavia. The first time I came here, I came with one of my controversial coffees, and I found a really nice friends and niche who appreciate something different. So then I start to learn about you guys, and I think that First, the Vikings shouldn't be just a helmet with two horns. It should be a helmet with two horns, an axe, just changing and cutting all things, and a cup of coffee in the other hand, because you guys are the bigger drinkers of coffee in the world. So that's our company, you We have been working with this concept just for a couple of years with some friends who helped us to develop this. Uh, I am a farmer. Uh, as I say, this... She told me a lot of that. I was born, grown, and for sure I will die in a coffee farm. It's no choice. Agronomist, I worked 15 years in microbiology. I have to take an MBA to understand how to make numbers in coffee. Still learning. Uh, my organic farms is one of my challenges, how to produce coffee organic. It's not easy all the time. Some places it's almost impossible. Uh, I am working now in Salvador, which is, is, I can say, is my second home now. Really nice country, nice people, beautiful coffee origin. I had the luck to represent Panama in the ICO for two years, learning a lot of the BS in coffee and how trades the big world of commodity, which is no game, I think. Uh, get a certified cook grader just to tell people that we know how to cook and we're still learning i think a lot of you guys teach me more than any of those courses uh, was the founder of hiu and uh, now i am working as a consultant to to develop different projects in salvador panama hawaii and ethiopia in different areas uh, that was my life before coffee i worked 15 years producing biopesticides, replacing chemicals, uh, producing organic compost, organic fertilizer, worms was the biggest, one of the biggest worm farms in Central America, producing different type of organic herbicides or organic fertilizers, producing also methane gas to see how we can take advantage of the waste, which is one of my key challenges in producing coffee. And that was the other part of my life. I love the sea, I love surfing, I love turtles. So I was producing and saving turtles, if you want to call it saving, it was really fun for a couple of years. And then I jumped in this farm, which was a cattle farm, almost at 2,000 meters elevation in Panama. Everybody told me that I was crazy, which I believe them to plant coffee at that altitude because nobody thinks that coffee could be produced in Central America above 1,800 meters elevation, which is another big lie. So that's Boquete, that's my hometown. I think it's really famous around the world because quality of coffee and 
more than the quality of coffee, I see the quality of people who's working with coffee there. So a lot of open mind people uh, trying to change things, uh, really good friends, it's a lot of young blood. It's a small, small origin in the world, but I see that it's one of the most academic farmers concentrated in one town. It's a lot of people with a lot of studies and big thinkers. And that's Lola Honest Farm. That was my dad part of the farm. We bought a farm together and he planted coffee. So I have to convince him like for two years to become organic. And the only way to convince him was buying his own coffee. So I got his cherries and I started to learn how to process coffee and how to export coffee. The coffee was at forty dollars, forty cents a pound at that time. So I decided to certify the farm in 2004, uh, which I think is, is cool, it's nice to be certified organic, but certification doesn't cover all the things, you know. Still a lot of certified wash coffee that is polluting a lot, a lot of water. This year, the pollution rate will be around 800 billion liters of water, 2012. And we have to change that. Then I can say I always will be thankful to this country. I went to Ethiopia, invited by some friends in 2005, and that totally hooked my life to coffee. I really changed when I saw all these people, you know, learning more and more about handcraft coffee, which is, I think is the best. And some of these crazy guys are still around, you know, and they're still growing, friends of yours. William was one of the first friends who invited me to Ethiopia drinking a jazz festival in Panama and two weeks later I was with him there. Uh, we were partners in HiQ and then I developed the company to HiU. David Roche, Yochu, Joseph Broski, Jeff. We were young in those times. That was a couple of years ago. And I think everybody is playing their own ball and everybody is learning a lot more from each other. But this, the beautiful thing here is that we have a beautiful friendship. Then I go back to Panama and start to make drying beds. Nobody was doing that there. Everybody was looking at me like, what the hell this guy is doing here? Okay? So I start to make the first honeys. And everybody look at me and say, you fermenting your coffee. They were right. That year I ferment 50% of my crop. But was the only way to learn. And then I own a lot to these guys too. Those are our coffee pickers in Panama. 95% of the coffee is picked by these guys. It's the poorest people in Panama. 92% extreme poverty today. 7% child mortality. So we make a coffee school with these guys and start to make bed with them. And they were the first natural and honeys that came out in Panama. And we found a way to was no electricity, no water in most of the places that we were processing. So we got some help and found some pulpers, hand pulpers, and some materials to build drying beds. And we put 135 of those guys in their own homeland, in the mountains, beautiful place in Panama. That's the future of the coffee in Panama, uh, to try something new, to try something different. My speech was about varietals. I think that we get a really nice speech about varietals from the our Brazilian friends here. And I see that varietals, they will show up in the coping table, so I won't bore you guys telling too much about varietals. It's a lot of good books that you guys read and have and know. So mainly, for me, the traditional varietals in Panama, and maybe some place in Central America, was Caturra, Tipica, Arabica, Recatuai, Bourbon, Mundo No, that was the main varietals, and Pacas in Salvador, I would say. And then, some years ago, I would say 10 years ago, people start to look for new varietals, and the first varietal that showed up with totally different crop profile was the Geisha varietal that was in Panama, and we were lucky to find them, and have been like the point of the arrow in the developing of new concepts in coffee. Not only in Panama, if not, I would say in all Latin America and other coffee origins now. Like. Then Pacamara, which I think is a high potential different varietal. Then we start to look for different colors in the cherries, yellow catuai, yellow caturra, pache, San Ramon, mocha, 
and it's a lot more there. You know, it's varietal that is planted in different places in Africa, you know, as a plantations. But a lot of them, they're still not in plantations. They're still in the forest or they're still in coffee collections. And nobody's taking, not too many people. These people are already taking chances planting some of those varietals in collections as coffee plantations. And we will have those cups pretty soon in our tables. So it's fun. It's exciting. So in 2006, I decided to plant geisha, 2,000 meters. And for me, these are the main elements to choose a coffee variety. For many, many years, and still nowadays, most of the research, I would say 90% of the morning coffee research is going to getting high yields in that varietal, tolerance or resistance to pests or fungal, or fungal diseases, fast grow, we need faster growing coffees, high density plantations, so we can take advantage of the area, uniform ripening, because labor is more expensive, so we need to harvest as much coffee as we can fast, and easy to mill, easy to process. And then on the other side, you guys, I think that the farmers were working with that, but roasters and traders start to work with the cup quality, you know, more roasters start to cup coffee, uh, became trainers in cupping coffee, roasters start to travel into origin, so I started the direct trade, a uh, barista trend, I seen that the baristas are changing a lot of things here. And then they start to travel into origin too, together with the roasters. And then, at last, more farmers start to travel into the market. So for me, that's the whole equation of trading coffee nowadays. It's totally different than 10, 15 years ago. That's my story, 2005, first organic uh, farm. 2006, I started to make the first Honest and Atlas that I export to Scandinavia. 2007, we changed all the processing of farms. I decided not to use any water, no more, in between 2007 and 2007, 8. 2009, we started our first project in Salvador to teach farmers, small farmers in the northern part of Salvador how to produce uh, honeys and Atlas. 2010, we went up to 243 farmers producing Honeys and naturals, and this year we get 537 farms producing honeys and naturals in Salvador. Our model of business, which is a service, is mainly train the farmers with different processing uh, protocols to establish a higher quality standards using basic equipment and tools. And that's the role of us, keeping roasters, baristas close to farmers and exporters. That's what we're looking for to give to our clients, unique flavors, unique stories, farmer benefits and eco-friendly coffees. So I think the market is really focused on that. Why well, seeing that we're really lucky to be playing ball right now in the coffee industry. For me, it's a new era in the coffee. We have new farmers, new business model, new processing technique, new varietal, new market niches that you guys are developing, and new products coming from coffee too, different than just the beans. And those are our focus in our company, honey coffee, high quality naturals, and different varietals. That's my reality, that's my climax, let's put it in that way. When I get my geisha in some of my really good friends, uh, and he's selling this coffee for that, and people is buying that pretty good. So that really is an incentive for a lot of people to, to do this. So that's what I am doing with farmers, training them how to produce in a different way, uh, using knowledge that the Ethiopians are using for many, many, many years, training them how to cop. A farmer won't change their coffee if they don't know how it tastes. It's impossible to do it in other way. And it's not only farmers in Central America and Africa. This is in Taiwan. We found like 400 farmers. They're producing honeys too in different things. It's a beautiful market. And then it's a big thing here. The first time that more than 100 farmers export coffee with their own name on the bags or the boxes was this project in Salvador. 
and it's an alliance with the biggest exporter of Salvador. So the farmer is paying for a service to the exporter to use their export license and pay for the dry mill. But that's how we market in our coffees with the picture of the farmer in the box. More true labeling than that. I don't believe in any certification now. For me, this is a certification. If the coffee is bad, this picture is there. So they understand that pretty clear. There are two things that change the farmer's mind. The price of the coffee is what they feel in their pockets and seeing their name in the market. That's what they feel in their heart. And then the market alliances, we start to know people, a lot of you guys that have been working in different ways. And for me, the best sustainability model is that. When the roaster or the barista know his farmer, his friendship, that's it. That's for me the most sustainable model. When you became a friend of your farmer, your roaster, your barista, or your trader, then it's a business for a long time. And direct trade, even if these guys don't buy too much naturals, they begin to cop some honeys. And some of them, they are using them. You know some people there. And then copying in the origin, copying in the markets is important. How the coffee tastes in the origin and how the same coffee tastes in the market. So I think that the baristas are now the point of the arrow to tell the roasters where to go. And that's a really smart move. And I don't believe in too much traditional things. So I, we keep the protocols for let's stop being in a boring business. You know, we can cop in the beach too, as Anders in a hammock. That's my hero, man. <laughs> <laughs> and then the barista connection, you know, is for us, for farmers, I think that should be the best guide, you know. And the barista need the farmers. You need to find special coffees that bring something new to the market. If not, the world barista competition will be so boring. I have so many of you guys that are playing that ball, but for me, that's, that's the link. Barista, roster, farmers. That's trade. The big traders, that's all. That's commodity, you know? And why we have to cup coffees using a cup? We can use glasses and so many years to try it. They have to find which coffee is good with their food or with their wine. It's about time. So for me, that's the link. That's the challenge, and we're playing a good ball. I think that the coffee world change when we start to do this. And it's becoming more and more fun. And then you see baristas trading, roasters trading, farmers trading. None of us were trading coffee 15 years ago. And we're sharing, like, with Morton, with Aleko, with Casey, with a lot of traders, new traders of a specialty coffee. We're a new generation. So I think that that's the best model that we can follow. And without being together and share our knowledge, share our experience, and learn from each other, that's the way that we can be, really make a new market that will be profitable for everybody, that we can help the poor farmer or the big farmers. But I think the quality is the key of that. And that's what everybody is working here. So instead of talking varietals, I just want to put that in your mind. I think that it's really nice how we opening to share. Not only what we're doing, if not, how we're approaching the market, how we're approaching the farmers, how we are changing our minds to new challenges. And those are really nice. It's fun, man. Being in the coffee business for a farmer was so boring. You guys have new machines to make espressos. High tech, you know, you know. Nowadays, I don't know which button to push. I am learning. <laughs> or new roasters that they look like spaceships. But they're good. Well, in the processing coffee industry, nothing changed in 90 years. The only innovation was the demusilaginators, which is 50 years old. And we're still polluting a lot of water. And we are certified organic, polluting all that. So I think that we have to change 
that mind. You know, we have to pull a little more attention to how we can help the farmers to change their mind in processing, in not polluting, in bringing new tastes. You know, when I decide not to do any wash coffee because I don't like to wash the sugars. I don't want to wash the oils. I don't want to wash the complex taste of the coffee fruit. That which I will talk a little bit about that in the next part of the presentation. So I want you guys to take a little look. We have some random sample of different varietals. We have five varietals here. We have Pacamara, Bourbon, Tipica, Catuai, Caturra, and Geisha in the tables. For sure, it's not watch. It's all naturals. So if it's controversial, so some of you guys, sorry. But that's what I do. So I hope you enjoy it. It's just for sharing, you know, and see how in naturals we can define also different crop profiles in the varietals. And you guys are the ones writing that. You guys are the ones taking that to the customers, which is our key point. So thanks a lot, and let's keep sharing, man. Okay, I, I think we might have time for one, two questions, questions? before we go yep. to the cupping tables. Yes, just yes, a sir. second. Uh, uh, here. I, I feel like behind, you know, being the yeah, Joshua. Yeah, well, 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 stand up. <laughs> uh, I, I agree entirely with you on the idea of having a direct connection between farmer, roasters, uh, and have a direct link. But I see a small problem when you're talking of uh, varieties and smallholders. This is the problem. Farmers very frequently in Central America uh, or, or Africa, even in India, uh, the producer are very small holders. Sometimes the quanti well, frequently, the uh, quantity they produce of that specific coffee of Katura, let us say. It, in that hill, which is different from next hill, uh, the amount of coffee actually provided is too small for commercial uh, label, let us say. How do you, do you okay, think? Okay, I, I, I understand your question pretty well. I see mm -hmm. that has been one of the paradigms in the industry, which is totally broke. You see nanolots, that's a new word that was invented like five years ago. I don't know who invented, but it fit the place. If the coffee has high quality, no one want to blend it. I have farmers with 60 pounds of coffee that I will kill myself before blending that coffee with something else because they're unique. They're just expressing a different, unique cup profile. And even in the same land, you have different terroir, different weather. It's like wine. We talk a lot about coffee following the wine industry. But you know what was the problem? We're not using tools to measure sugars, to measure acids, to measure tannins, to measure many things that the wine industry is measuring. Um, besides that, sorry, I, I forgot I get a piano in my head if I move out of here. <laughs> Let's go this a piano. Uh, but what I think is that what we're believing, not thinking, what we're doing is taking that small farmer with two small boxes of coffee to the market with his name because it's the only way that he will recognize and that all the value change can send that money back which your clients are paying for quality. So for me that's a myth. If you have a 90 points coffee, you won't blend that. If you have 25 pounds, you will keep it. A lot of you guys are buying those coffees. And that makes us to work in those coffees in a totally different way. We're not selling commodity here. If we're thinking that we're making containers of 90 points coffees, we're really high. Maybe we're high, and we have to keep on that. Because there are a lot of good coffees there, but we have to teach those guys how to keep that quality. And if you ask me if I buy coffee, I don't buy coffee. I call a lot of my colleagues coffee hunters because they're hunting for the best cup of coffee in a cupping table. I believe in hunting farmers. 
we have to teach them. When you find a good coffee, go to the farmer and incentive him to keep his quality and help him to make it good, to bring those 100 pounds, 1,000 pounds, or whatever, intact to the market. That's a challenge that we have. Sweet. Thank you. Let's uh, go to the, we will clap for him later as well. You can give him a round of applause now. So please uh, find your cupping table, start uh, the dry. Rock and roll. Uh, Pacamaras for me is a different acidity. You have 11 different lines of Pacamara that were developed in Salvador. No have been developed any other more from those, the original ones. They were spread. I have been trying to cop all of them in Salvador. We got, what happened is that they developed them and they blend them. And they start to give it for free, those seeds to the farmers. So you have pacamaras that have, are really pungent, almost like shallots or onions, are really herbal, the other in the middle. And then you have some pacamaras that are more fruits. And I would say that the acidity of those pacamaras is not like dark fruits. It's more like yellow fruits, or I would say even tamarind, which the acidity is more, more sharp. Uh, when we make a natural with those coffees, I see that the intensity of everything gets stronger because it's a low density bean. It's a big bean. And when you have a big bean, for me it's like a sponge or a hole and cheese with a lot of holes inside. And when you, the only way to fulfill those holes is with sugars, oils, and water, and air. So when you guys roast, the first thing that comes out is the air. The second thing that comes out is the water, and then you start to burn the sugars, and when you get to a second crack, you're taking out the oils. So it's totally logical. Physiologically, in the physiology of the bean, that's a really simple way to understand it, I think, even for the farmers. Uh, the pacamara for being a low density bean, as geisha or typica, that longer, they have more capacity to keep sugar seen. So when you make a honey or a natural, you will see that the cup profile goes to sweetness because there are more sugars and the acidity is more intense. Also the tannins. It's more body there. All these varietals you will find, some of them that are really low, medium, mellow bodies, the body gets more intense. You get more chocolates, you get more spices. So for me, that's, that's a, a pacamara. One of the questions in the table was, what about fermentation? I see that we have been drinking a lot of fermented naturals for a long time. And the way that we that's what I mentioned, we are doing high quality naturals because a lot of naturals in the world. But most of them, they have been processed with the worst coffee in the farms or whatever float in the floating tanks for doing white coffee or whatever is green that the pulpers cannot peel it. So taking a ripe bean, measuring the sugars, which is different in different varietals, the lower sugar rates that we have in the measures that we have been doing, doing the last five years is pacamara and geisha. It's the less sugar content fruits, the fruit, the cherry. The highest have been catuai pacas. I never tried mocha yet measuring that, but I'm sure that it's high sugar too because they're smaller and more dense beans. So in the outside of the cherry, when you measure the cherries, the fresh cherry, they're higher concentration of sugars. When you measure the cup, which is the relation or the correlation that we have been doing, measuring the cherries and then measuring the sugars in the cup when we're cupping, we found that the less density that we were like crazy. If this fruit have more sugars, why has less sugar lecture in the cup? Because it has less space to keep those sugars. The porosity is less. So the sugars are taking the space that is with water and air normally. That's a logical conclusion for us. Okay? 
The Bourbon is one of the most extensive varietals in Salvador. Uh, you have different Bourbons. Other thing that is really affecting the how the varietal taste is the altitude, for sure. Higher altitude, more density, smaller beans, higher concentration of sugars is totally related and more weight. Higher density is more weight because it's less air. And at the same time, in the fruit, in the mucilage, and the skins are more sugars. And we have lectured for four or five years doing this in Panama and Salvador. Geisha uh, is the same that applied for Bacamara, I would say, for me. And Tipica is the third in that line, okay? You have another varietals like Marago Hipe, which is even less than Pacamara in sugar, sugar contents, or Pache, which is a big bean too. And then Catuai for me is the more dark fruit or red fruits taste, you know, and less acidity. It's more sugars, more sweetness. The typica is more, I would say, citrusy, citrus acidities, even sweet too but more chocolate when you make a clean natural. The geisha is still the floral, as the typica too. Typica is coming with some florals most of the time, as well as the bourbon, which are citrus floral varietals, I would say, in my palate. But geisha comes out with the jasmine or peach, or you have these guys that when they try a geisha, they became Carmen Miranda, I say. Many people also know Carmen Miranda was a lady with a big basket full of fruits, you know, and you have pin, pineapple, bananas, mangoes, oh my God. You know, you get lost. And sometimes they hint different fruits that we are not used to mention in a copy. And that's it. You know, for me, the base of those naturals is using drying beds, which is clean. For me, taking care of a ripe, beautiful cherry is totally different. It's like taking a baby and putting the baby to sleep in the floor instead of a bed, the same. You know, when you get a bean or a cherry with high sugar content, it's sticky. When it's drying, the sugars are coming out to the skin. So when you're moving that in the patios, it's no patio 100% clean. And you don't have 1,000 ladies cleaning that every day. They're just moving the coffees. And it's dust, it's summertime, it's a lot of wind, and it's dry. So it's perfect for getting dusty environments. So a lot of the pole naturals that is drying in patios, from my friends in Brazil, I think that a lot of them, they're not that clean, or they're a little bit uh, earthy or dusty, because they have dust. It's, for me, it's just observing what's happening in the, in the drying patios. Okay? Watch is totally different. Watch, you wash all the sugars. You have no sugars there. But a pull natural, you touch it and they keep in your, stick to your hand. Or a really ripe natural also will stick to your hand. But in the drying beds, it's a different way to manage these sugars. Okay? Not the beans. For me, it's all about sugars, stickness, you know? And you can stick really good things, and you can stick really bad things too. So I don't know if there are questions, or you guys have comments about it. Maybe I know that a lot of people is not too used to naturals. They like a lot of watch. But I will really like to, to hear your feedback. So questions or comments? Anybody? Come on. And you're too shy or too tired. <laughs> All the, all the coffees are, most of them are dying in the farm. You know, the concept is not moving the coffees from the farm. So how do you deal with the rain? You cover it. You know, you will see in the processing part, there are a lot of people using different things. I think that most of them are valid. Uh, and it's not only the rain, it's the humidity at night. When you're in the tropics, before 8 o'clock in the morning, you have a different relative humidity on the air. And after 4 o'clock, the same. So, and we're harvesting sometimes in high elevations a longer time. 
you're harvesting maybe four or five months. You are doing four, five, six pickings in the fields. So it's really variable. So what you need to do is find the driest time in the day, at least in or protocols to doing it. And for us, it's enough six hours of good sun in the driest part of the day. If it's raining, we don't open the beds. Or if it's raining too much and you know that it's going to rain, it's people using type of greenhouses or tunnels or it's a lot of people doing innovations and developing in this, you know. And I think that that's one thing that the farmers have to do. You know, it's really creative people. And it's people that maybe doesn't know how to read, but they know how to think. So it's really practical ways to just tell them what you want. And tell them more than one time, because they maybe don't understand the first time. Any other question? Johan asked me a little bit about fermentation. I would prefer to talk about fermentation in the processing uh, talk that we will have, which is key in the different process of coffee. And is key for the taste of, of the coffee itself. OK, guys, coffee break? <laughs> OK, guys. Uh, I will pass a really fast video just to give an idea how it works, how we're doing this project in Salvador with so many farmers that sometimes it's a little bit hectic, you know, because when you came with a, with a cooperation project in any country, all the farmers think that they're getting things for free. And it's true. Most of the times, these corporations give different things for free to the farmers. And most of the time, they're teaching how to do something to them, but that's it. A lot of the consultancy programs I have known, they teach the farmer how to do something or the people how to do something, but at the end, the marketing part is the biggest, big losing gap. You know, you make the best spoon in the world, but after we teach you how to do it, find your own market. And that's what we're trying to turn around a little bit. And I think that most of the models that or my colleagues in the, in the room are doing is that, working from the, farm, from the market all the way down to the farm. So I would put this is in Spanish. I would put those are uh, different areas where we're working. And I will pass by some, some of the things. Those are the farmers, really small. We explain them in different ways. First, you know, they have to go to the movies to see what's going on. And they like that. That's key. It's no, that's the normal quality in Salvador for general. When we start to do this in a drying bed and pick all the beans out, after two days, they start to harvest a really ripe coffee, you know? And you have to show them, hands on, what's a green bean, what is a no ripe cherry. And you get something beautiful after that, anywhere in the world. Sorry for the males. <laughs> and how to build a drying bed. You can use anything. Bamboo is one of the cheapest and low cost woods for structure. And those are mother the age. You see really old guys, young guys working that. We deliver them the materials and the pulpers in their own farms. All the beds are is on site on the farms. And here is a few interviews. I kind of, I am asking him if what he thinks about the the drying system in beds. It's less polluted, he said. Doesn't get dust, doesn't have garbage around. The dogs doesn't sleep on the coffee <laughs> or the or the chickens which is normal in coffee farms. 
But he says that the, he processed good his coffee, expecting a better payment or a better money for his coffee. This guy found his, his roster already in Czech Republic, in Prague. So 120 of these farmers, they already, I would say, married to a roster. And the rest, they're still moving around. This guy, his father, was the winner of the Cup of Excellence in Salvador, 2008. He's a famous coffee, La Montaña. He's Alexander Ochoa, Roberto Ochoa, his father. And he's trying honeys for the first time. That was two years ago. And he's just with a lot of doubts in his head, you know. He never sell the coffee. We never cup the coffee yet. And he married to Johan and Nisson. <laughs> okay, I will move this a little bit more. And you have uh, Ignacio Gutierrez, Nacho Gutierrez, La Roxanita. That was the winner of the Cup of Excellence in Salvador with Watch, 2010, sorry, 2011, last year. And Jaroslav, if I double check, I think that all of you know him from Czech Republic, from Prague. And he was looking for his farmer there. Mainly I am telling them that the roster want to meet, meet them, you know, to get direct connections with them. Sorry. You know these guys? <laughs> that was 9.30 at night. <laughs> Everybody was tired, complaining, but I think that you can find that coffee here. <laughs> the coffee is good, we buy it, they say. And they follow the word, man. And that's it, you know? That's our role, to make that connection. And that's the other part, you know, going to different places to copy coffee with people. and portray their coffees in, in different rosters, you know? I see, just to give a short idea what the whole programs are for. So, that's it, man. Simple. Okay, perfect. Okay, let's go to processing. A lot of people was asking here for more technical things. So we have it here. Sorry. Oh my God, what happened? <laughs> Hello. Okay, there we are. Okay, green coffee processing technology. That's what I was telling you that it's getting old, you know. It's few changes in the coffee processing techniques. Some of them, they're really old, but we think that the best, that's our concept about, you know, best quality coffee, must be clean, a clean way to get there basing essential elements involved in the high quality of the cherry and the high quality of the green bean, ready to be roast. Simple concept which ends in your client's palate. So, too philosophic, but that's it. And that's the coffee fruit. We're using only 45% of whatever is there, the green beans. The rest, we're throwing that away from a long time. What we're trying to do nowadays is see how we can use that. I was working with that before working with coffee. I was working with the pulp to make fertilizer for a long time. Right now, is people find out that in all that mucilage, which is the membrane that looks like jelly, is one of the highest antioxidant contents fruits in the world. 
Acai fruit is one of the super fruit now. Coffee has 10 times more antioxidants than acai. Besides that, the skin has a lot of taints. There's a lot of energy drinks using that because the coffee has caffeine that keeps you up for sport men. Antioxidants, a lot of vitamin C. Coffee has more vitamin C than many, many citrus and have 13% protein. So it's a really good, good element for making any energy drink. And you have a lot of them using that. You have Kona Red, you have Bai, and for sure there are more coming out. So it's a new <coughs> door in the industry for those drinks. And your clients are drinking that too. That's the what you saw before, if you go to the physiology of the plant, it's all related. It's a living organism where it's the seeds. We're roasting the seeds of the plant. So the embryo has all the germination capability, which is surviving of this species. It's a high osmotic organism, so it's really permeable. That's why coffee can get polluted really easy or contaminated. It's like a sponge. It gets different odors, tastes, whatever you put around, coffee can take it. Phytohormones is really high concentration of not only antioxidants, vitamins, proteins, because it's an important part of the plant. It's the next generation, and you need those hormones to grow. So in the cherries, to change colors, to become differentiated the seeds, there are different type of hormones that act in that. All those are in the seeds. And then you have germination in, in, in inhibitors, too. So you can plant a coffee cherry right away you harvest, and once come out. You have a, a latency, sorry for my English, a, have a dormant stage, and those are the ones who make that happen. And then you have the other parts, which is the parchment, which is pure cellulose that is protecting. It's a membrane that is protecting the seeds. And then you have the pulp, which is the mucilage, which has a lot of nutri nutrients to make that seed, to feed that seed on between it germinates before getting roots. And then you have the exocarp, which is the skin, which keeps permeable the, all those elements inside the, the coffee seed. That was, sorry, that was mixed there. Harvesting 911, that's the worst element in coffee quality. If you don't harvest good your cherries, it's impossible to get a specialty coffee. A lot of farmers doesn't understand this. And a lot of places, they don't can use labor because it's too expensive. They have to use machines. Or it's too big, they don't have enough people. So that's why the industry developed machines to separate greens, to float it, to make the siphon. Uh, the siphon, just to tell you a little story, was developed in Boquete by, by a French engineer that was working in the Panama Canal. And the guy was the owner of Lerida Farm. That was the guy who built that farm. Uh, but it's a lot of brilliant people working on that. That's basic in, in the processing, the quality of hand picking, the effect of cherries versus effects in the cup. You will see a slide that project them. Greens. You will see some really nice green patios. Dry and early deaths, that's abortion, that the plant doesn't have enough nutrients, or the climate conditions or diseases doesn't allow the fruit to develop. Those are the drier deaths. Young, fungi attacks, incident attacks, like coffee borer, contamination effects, which is mainly high toxic chemicals or herbicides and overdoses.
because the farmer, if he doesn't kill the insect, they are used to put more insecticides. And that's changing a lot. In Panama, it's really normal now to use this. If you don't get the cherries that say Cafe Maduro or ripe, ripe cherries, this one here, they discount the money from you. I am pushing this with the naturals a little bit over here, okay? And that's it. You know, you get, not only the farmer is losing money because of quality. Uh, on ripe bean, like that, is you, the farmer is losing 50% of the weight, it's losing 50% of their money, or the potential to get their money. Half ripe is 30%, and three quarter ripe is 20%. The point is that the percentage of rapiness rape, in the cherries is totally related to weight and sugar levels. A red cherry has double 50% more sugars than a green cherry. And the relation in weight is totally direct to the relation in sugars in the cherries. There are many different ways to measure this. That's a, we call it the probit test. You just sample the bag with the cherries, put it in a bucket with five gallons of water, whatever float. You take it out, put it back in the probit, which is one liter or thousand milliliters, and that gives you the percentage of cherry defects. Okay, it's not only, we're used to see defects in the green beans. You can see defects on the cherries. And we're measuring that nowadays. I told you about this. I won't go one by one, but all the defects that you find in the cup are related to a physical action on the cherries. You have immature black stinkers, moldy, sour, insect damage, soil, broken, feather, foxy, corded, row, and all those give you these defects in the cups. So it's, it's a big relation. That's the importance of taking care of those cherries, and those cherries have to be like that. That's a specialty coffee. And that's really hard to be understand, understood by the farmer if he doesn't have an incentive to do that. Why? It's easier just to rape the stem and bring everything that is in the stem, and it's faster to harvest coffee like that. And they get paid by volume. So now everything is changing. In Panama, we pay by quality of harvesting. And that means that this guy can make 30% or even 50% more money if he brings this coffee to us. Because I am losing money in my farm if he brings a green bean. And if he brings green beans, I discount money from him. They have to be clear of that. The pickers have to be clear that that's a reality. That's a different ways to harvest this tree will be hand selective, selective picking, non-hand selective picking, hand non-selective picking, that means pick, taking everything, hand mechanical picking, the Brazilian have developed already different machines that are mechanical, but they, they are like backpacks that, that they're using for doing this, and mechanical picking, which are big machines for being extensions. That's what we get from processing wash coffee, okay? That's really, really polluted water. Because all the sugars became alcohols. And we think, okay, it's pollution. Well, the pollution is that when it goes to the water streams or the creeks, it's so rich in different nutrients that the algae grow really fast in those rivers or creeks. And whatever is living there, is without oxygen. The algae are taking all the oxygen, so the concentration of oxygen in the water goes really down, and nothing else can live without different type of lichens or algae. So that's a reality too. And well, you have it there, you know. That water is have been used three times to ferment the same coffees. 
because it's a limited element. It's less water available for farming all around the world. And in some places where you guys get coffee in some origins, it's becoming more and more expensive. In Hawaii, it's, a, it's crazy. I was just a month and a half ago there, and people, farmers have to pay for the water, really expensive money. And other places, you have to bump the water. So we need to see what we do with that. There are three elements that are key in the processing of coffee. Energy is no cheaper than a year ago. Every day is more expensive. It's few people using alternative energy in coffee. Most of it is still fossil fuels or electrical energy or hydroelectrical. Transportation, again, gasoline is not less expensive. And even the mules of the horses cost more money than 20 years ago. And then the human factor. And I think that that's the most key factor that we can have an impact, changing the mind of the people changing the mind of the farmer and the workers in the processing plants. I won't go in detail on this, but these are all the steps in a traditional wet mill. You see how many different steps are there? How you're taking the greens out, the pulps out, how they go in. Imagine that these are different channels, all moved by water. The only way to go from one step to the other is push by water. Like that. That's a floating tank. You see the amount of clean water that is getting there. The coffee is the normal way that we buy the coffee by weight or by volume. And then they pull this, poof, and goes here. And whatever is not good floats. And everything is moving in that system with water. Then the pulpers, the fermentation tanks, different ways to wash, you know. Free drying, mechanical dryers use a lot of energy. Right now in Central America, 70% of the source of energy for the mechanical dryers is still being wood. In Costa Rica, was a study made by MIT or Massachusetts Technology Institute seven or eight years ago, and the deforestation use for the coffee industry industry every year is more than 13,000 hectares. And those are one of the best wet coffees or wash coffees in the world. That was the ma main innovation, was developed 50 years ago. The, the musulaginators then became the eco pulpers. And that can reduce 90% the use of water. And that's a big discussion between the people that ferment coffee. It's just to remo remove the musulage or a lot of roasters think that improves the quality. So that's a controversial point still nowadays. And it's a good point. I have a lot more studies. It's people doing a lot of studies, OK? It's a lot of hypotheses. It's nothing became a theory yet, nothing proved. Those are the musalinators. It's just by friction, using less water, taking this out. semi wash coffees is that. semi wash use less water more physical friction, and it's a more simple system. You can see it there. It's a big thing between was honey coffee and was pole natural. Pole natural still float the beans, still use some water. Honey coffee is zero water. That's it. When we start to do this, people was really complaining. Not only the people who buy the coffee, because could be fermentation there, and we ferment a lot of coffee at the beginning, and these people beginning doing what honeys, and they're fermenting coffee the first times. But we're, you know, getting more close to a protocol where we can avoid that, because sticky. The honey was a joke, but it was reality. When we started to do honeys, I was with a good friend of mine, uh, Joseph Broski, you know him? We were in Panama doing the first honeys and tasting. I want him to taste it. And he came to the tables, and we were moving the coffees. And then everybody was complaining. And he said, man, what happened with the honeys? Say, well, people is complaining here. And say, 
Yeah, people is bitching because it's sticky, the bee, so we put honey bee. And the bee wasn't because bees, it was because bitching. And those were some honeys. You can see the sugar stick. It's like a cracker jack, or it's like something that the sugar really, you can see how clean they are, the smell, really like molasses. And that's really simple. That's what we're doing. We put in two generations there. That's the best heritage that that guy can give to that kid, to teach him how to make money in his farm, doesn't go to the cities, doesn't find another source of income. Doesn't mean that he cannot study or become a lawyer or a doctor or whatever, but he has to keep that coffee farm. In Boquete, in my hometown, in 12 years, we lost 50% of the coffee area. And it's going down still because it's booming as a touristic place. That's in the novice. That's the, when we start, that's all you need to make honey coffees. A pulpit and drying beds and good farmers. And those are the drying beds. We start to change the materials that the Ethiopians were using. Now this is coming back to Ethiopia, thanks God. And we were talking about when it rains, that's what you can do, you know. And then comes all, something even simpler. That is the natural process. That is the oldest way to process coffee. And that's 30% of exports of Salvador coffee. We weigh, and only Salvador, I would say all Latin America. We make a monitoring in 14 of the biggest mills in Salvador, and the average was between 27% to 35% of green, totally green cherries. When you export 1 million bags, that means 300,000 bags that they're losing. They don't need any cooperation or any money from USID or the, community, the European community. It's there. Just let those beans ripe, man. And you have all the money to improve your industry. For me, that's it. You know, it's different positive things that the, these two methods can bring to the industry. You know, it's improving the quality, the market is opening to them, it's not what they lose. You save 40% of your money compared to wash coffee. High quality naturals is really basic for espresso, which is a big market here, and all the baristas have to compete with that. Uh, it's low energy use, so you're saving energy. No machines besides a pulper. If it's natural, you don't need any machine. No fermentation if you do it in the right way. And it's a great potential for remote areas, which is, I would say, close to 50% of the coffee areas in the world. And that's high quality naturals. That's how we push in the farmers to do the naturals. Those is in Los Lajones, that's in Salvador. You can see here, we're beginning to learn. We're learning every year here. We start to use mulch, which is waste from a farm by producing ferns for bouquets of flowers. But we're measuring the temperature here, and we're measuring not only the temperature, the percentage of humidity in the airflow. Most of the people think, OK, it's the sun which is drying my coffee. Wind dries more than sun. So we have to change our mentality. That's why that, that guy never believed in this. Now it's no batch of coffee that he doesn't eat in the farm touching that. So before he goes to the farm in the morning, now he's in the afternoon just moving every day's batch. And that's in Salvador. We build three hectares of drying beds that can process up to 5,000 bags of coffee just with drying beds. And that's why I think that each of the coffees Ring, you know, wash is a big market for wash. I believe in wash, and believe me, I will do wash again when you can find a way to produce wash or wash coffee without using water. Honeys and naturals, and then exotic varieties. And those are key points, you know, in the processing. Uh, the icing is the basic for all the people that is trading. 
especially in coffee. The new traders, which I call some of the people that we are just trying to bring a good coffee to the market. It's a hard work. A lot of you guys that have traveled to Origin, it's fun, it's nice to see the farmer. Most of the time you see the best guys. The rest of the people, sorry for the word, they're really, really bad. They're producing chili coffee, okay? <laughs> uh, and that's it, you know, it's, I think, it's how I see you guys. I see Scandinavia industry changing fast. For me, guys, you have been the architect of the cup profile of coffee. The first barista champions were here. You, some of you guys are leading that movement because you start to structure, to design. You're great designers. You're teaching the world. And the world is learning fast. So that's why the world is competing with you guys, which is good. But the main first archi architectures in the quality of a cup of coffee, I think, was Scandinavia. And that's great. I am really honored to, to be with you guys here because each time I come to these latitudes, I am learning a lot. And we need to know what you guys want and what you guys are developing so the farmers can follow the lead. Also, I think that we need to create new supply chains of non-conventional coffee. I think that's what Morton is doing, what my friend, farmers from Brazil are doing, what the CEF is doing. It's a new movement. So if we scare of the market, no guys, we trust you. I think that is a good challenge. And we need to have and work all together to come this out. And I think that this part of the world will be leading the coffee industry all the time. Besides you drinking more coffee, you have to put your people to drink better coffee. That's all. Any questions? Questions for Graciano? Anyone? Come on, people. Wake up. People need coffee here. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. You mentioned that you deduct money from the farmers if they give you green coffee. Yeah. How, how does that work? Uh, how, how does the farmer... Okay, How let's, many let's, times? Yeah. let's put it in this way. If, if uh, we weigh the, far, the coffee, it's becoming more weight than volume nowadays. And if we detect, we have always someone supervising the quality when the pickers bring the coffee to be measured, you know, they, to or be weight. And if we detect green beans, we put the picker to select it under their own time. If no, we won't receive the coffee or he's fired. He cannot pick coffee in our farms. It's the only way to do that. We have to be hardcore disciplined in this. The other way is that whatever weights in green he takes out, we deduct all the way down to 50% of whatever he's getting paid for harvesting any kilo of coffee. So he lost 50% of his salary. He doesn't pick or select good the cherries that he's bringing. So, so this is penalty. Is there any incentive for him only to pick? Yeah, the incentive the is that they're getting at least 50% more money if they pick coffee in our farms compared to our neighbors or commercial coffees. I've seen that some of the people that have visited our places, just to put an example, in Panama the price for picking 30 pounds of coffee last year was $1.75, 30 pounds of cherries. We were paying $3.50. And we never were out of people who wants to pick coffee on farms. But that assures me that my quality always will be a high standard cherries. And that's the same that we're doing in Salvador. So this message is really simple to understand by people. You know, if I don't bring whatever they want or if I lose money doing this, people change. All right. Question? Yeah. Picker and the farmer is the same person, when you say they get 350. Well, in, in Panama, it's few farmers that is picking their coffees, to be honest. Yeah. 
Okay? The only farmers that pick their own coffee is the novice. Yeah, okay? okay? And Salvador is a different story. Yeah. A lot of the small farmers, they work in picking their own coffee. So in Africa also. But in Latin America, it's, I doubt it. In Brazil, the farmers are picking the coffees. You know? They're working in selecting, you know, it's tough to be a really small farm holder. When you have more than one hectare of coffee, you need people to pick it with you. And if you get people picking coffee with you, you better watch out what they're doing instead of exactly. be picking coffee yourself. So it's totally related to the area or the size of the farm, of the farmer. So you get paid by day or by? No, no, by weight. Yeah, exactly. By weight. At the beginning, maybe what we're doing in the harvesting is that we send people to pick all the defects, cherries, First, and we pay more money for that coffee because it's less. But when they come, came into the field again to do the first harvest, there's no defects there. So we put like 10% of the pickers ahead, and then the rest behind just picking good cherries. And it works. OK, and two more questions. Uh, I'm interested in the fermentation. Um, what are the things you found out that are really relevant to the quality? You said it's uh, humidity, also uh, sugar levels. What about pH values and stuff? Or what's, how do you find out if it works well or not? Okay, if you have a, I will relate, I don't do wash coffee, but the time that I was doing wash coffee, there were two key factors here for fermentation. Depends if you, you have fermentation after four hours. When you pick the cherries, the cherry itself starts to ferment. All the sugars, mainly if they're inside a bag, the temperature is heating up. So the beans inside that bag start to fermentate after four hours. So the only way to avoid that is that you measure or receive coffee from the pickers twice a day. That's a really simple way to manage that. The other thing is fermentation in the fermentation tanks. You need to measure different things. Temperature is key. Temperature is basic for the time that you last your coffee in the fermentation tank. Lower te temperature, longer time in the fermentation tank. Higher temperatures, less time in the fermentation tanks. Semi-wash is fermentation in the channels where you're moving the coffees to the patios. The pH of the water has a lot of relation with the solids, so the content of solids in the liquid, in the solution, in the water. So it's totally related to. And more clean the water, better fermentation you have. Cleaner fermentation. That's what I, I will have like indicators to measure fermentation. Does answer your question or? I will answer the question. Okay, yeah. maybe the people want to know, so I can. Uh, no, uh, I mean the coffee charts seem to be quite different, also the sugar levels and stuff. That's yeah. the main driving factor then. Okay, it's, it's harder to fer yeah, it's harder to ferment when you have green cherries and ripe cherries together in the same fermentation tank. It's not uniform, for sure. And you will get a stringency there, for sure. And the fermentation process will be slower. And then you over ferment the really ripe ones, and the green ones will never ferment. They will dry up. I don't think there's too many people doing that, but you see the level of color or ripeness, yeah. you know, in the in the tanks. And most of the time is you have like half ripe, 50%, 25% really ripe, and 25% green in general, in Latin America, I would say, in commercial coffee. Okay, okay. I, I don't have a lot of experience with honey coffees, but looking at how it looks like when you dry it, there's a lot of mucilage stuck uh, still on the, on the parchment. Uh, is there any other sort of uh, defects you can get from uh, f like any attacks on the on the parchment or any uh, fungus or bacteria or anything that you have to be aware yeah. of? Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a lot of. You no, know, our experience with with doing honey coffee is that you layer 
in the beds shouldn't be more than one inch thick. When you get more than one inch, you have fermentation inside you. The other way is how often you move your coffees. At the beginning, we were moving the coffees every hour. Right now, we move the coffees just three times a day. Uh, the other thing is, a lot of people ask me, ants. We never see ants in the, in the beds. We don't know why. You know, because it's sweet. Normally, when you get sugars, ants go for sugars, or other insects. Uh, but mainly is that, you know. The other one is leaving the coffees open during the night. The mucilage start to get humidity again. So it takes longer or start to ferment. If you leave the bed open and don't close it and cover it with plastic, so normally when you pull it, roll it, you have just one third of the table that is getting humidity from underneath. But the, like when you put this together, it's in the afternoon after having six, eight hours of sun, the temperature is, is higher. So the heat of the, this bunch of coffee doesn't allow the humidity to get in. So it's a small, small percentage of beans, of parchment, that will get high humidity from under it. But yeah, when you play with more than one inch, for sure you get some fermentation in the hoods. And that took us like three years to come down to that. You need more bed space, which is, is maybe a higher investment. We think that we can amortize the beds in three crops. Should be like that. You know, they should last three crops. Uh, the materials that you use, the size of the holes in the nets, in those black uh, chain nets that they use for chain. Uh, also the type of plastics. We start with white plastic, yellow, we try different colors, green, red, black plastic keeps more the temperature. Also what we're doing now is trying to cover the plastic that we use to cover at night, put it in the sides during the day, so the airflow underneath will have a higher temperature and will move faster. You know, the hot air goes from low to up. So in the bed, you hit the beds and move with the flow. Also, you should make your beds in the direction of the sun. So you get more, more exposure to the sun during the day. And the other one is try to get that with your wind currents. Normally, when you dry in coffee, it's summertime in our countries. And you get more wind. And that wind should flow underneath the beds all the time. The other one is cover your dust. You know, it's easy when you get a dusty, really dry area, that's what you want in drying beds, have a lot of dust. When people walk, you can see the cloud of dust around. So that's why we start to use a type of mulch, the cheapest mulch that we can use. You know, it's maybe cutting grass or cutting weeds or whatever <coughs> other type of mulch that we can use that doesn't smell too much or doesn't contaminate the the others of the of the coffee. Sweet. There will be another round of uh, four questions after the cupping. Thank you, Graciano. Okay. Thanks for you guys. There is one more cupping. <laughs>